I need a little time to get ready here. I can show a few. All right. Just start going down my list and then. Sure. Okay, you should see my database here. Yep. Yes. This is a, <clears throat> a patient who recently came in. He has an elevated right hemidiaphragm as he's probably related to his liver transplant that he's had in the past. And you can see he's got some surgical clips in, in his upper abdomen. He also underwent a, a kidney transplant at the same, same time. So he's immunosuppressed and comes in with a few weeks of worsening dyspnea. And he also has now, uh, he had a few skin lesions, like six or seven around his, or different parts of his body, left ankle pain and vision loss in one of his eyes. Now, I don't know what you guys think. I mean, this was called normal. And maybe in retrospect, it looks a little busy, but I think it's pretty, you know, if anything's called here, it's pretty subtle and, and wouldn't be very specific calling this abnormal. But of course, on his CT, then you can see this CT was done the following day, that he has miliary nodules. And it's a nice, you know, it's a nice example. They're in a random distribution. They touch the fissures, touch the pleura, as you can see, especially along the minor fissure. I always find that a good place to look. And so this was, of course, no known history of cancer. He's immunosuppressed because he's an organ transplant, so TB or fungal infection. And he is from around the Central Valley. And so I guess the ID and derm took one look at his his skin lesions and were thinking this was probably going to be coxy, which they did a punch biopsy of one of his skin lesions and it did turn out to be miliary coxy. So here are the few of the different uh, skin lesions he had. And I thought this was cool. They even took a photo of their fundoscopic exam. And he has this you know, big lesion in his retina from where the, the coxy had gotten into his eye and why he was having uh, vision loss as well. So just a typical you know, case of miliary. I do have one question for you guys because I know this is, I've heard this before in the context of tuberculosis, at least when you have miliary disease, that it often can have an upper lobe predominance relative to the lower lobes, kind of the opposite of what you think with miliary metastases. And you can see here that while it is random and you do have nodules in the lower lobes, there certainly seems to be a gradient where you have more in the upper lobes. And theory I've heard is just difference in, in oxygen tension. But I don't know if you if you guys can confirm that or if you've seen the same thing with other fungal infections as well. I have not seen that, but I usually to me it's sort of diffused. I mean, we see miliary histo every so often and occasional cases of miliary blastomycosis. Um, and they've always been just very diffuse. I've not appreciated that yeah. but i'd have to go back and think about it and look at it a little bit because i i've heard that a couple of different times from from different people and it, it may just be anecdotal because i can't find any literature to support mm -hmm. that but at least in this case it you know there's definitely a little bit more of an upper lobe predominance to the to the nodules even though they are diffused david are you aware of anything like that no um <clears throat> you know i have a feeling that People may be carrying over the TB business that, you know, reactivation TB is supposed to be upper lobe or something like that. Yeah. I don't know. I thought miliary stuff is really determined more by blood flow and it usually is pretty uniform or worse in the bases. That's what I would think too. Yeah. Okay. I just thought I'd throw that out there just because I, I can't confirm it and I don't like perpetuating myths. So. This one was a fun one that came in the other day. I think it's a it's a nice, I'll just start with the most abnormal radiograph. And this is in the middle of a series of different radiographs and I'll show you the, the CTs. So this is a patient who had had a, a bronchoscopy a couple of days prior and was becoming more and more short of breath. It had a little bit of bleeding after the bronchoscopy. And I can just put this up next to their you know, pre-procedure radiograph. So I think this is a good one for the, the residents. I always think it's fun when you have, you can, you can have satisfaction of search because everybody looks at this and says, oh, there's, looks like there's right middle and lower lobe collapse. You've lost the diaphragm. You've got a lot of volume loss. You don't really see the minor fissure here. You've lost the right heart border. But then also you can see that there's a subtle you know, veiling opacity in the left upper hemithorax and 
maybe you can tease out a tiny little ellipsical here. But this patient underwent a repeat CT because they had had because of the worsening dyspnea. And you'll see on the CT done around the same time as that radiograph that they do in fact have combined left upper lobe collapse. And this is presumably just a little bit of clot in the bronchus plus right middle and right lower lobe collapse. All of these calcifications I'll show you in a second on the pre-op study were just around, they were just calcified lymph nodes because the patient had come in with bronch with hemoptysis and I, I read this pre-op study and didn't see any any broncholiths, just looked like calcium in hilar lymph nodes, certainly old granulomatous infection. I guess that when the, the interventional pulmonologist went in, he saw some areas where it looked a little hyperemic and that's why he biopsied, but she had bled enough that I guess it plugged up her bronchus intermedius and her left upper low bronchus. So fun radiograph from the ICU. Yeah. Do you, um, so on, <clears throat> on a lung window, is it really middle lobe plus lower lobe or just lower lobe collapse? I think it was, I think it was uh, the middle lobe. Yeah, the middle lobe more is, anterior, there's more more of an anterior component usually when the lower lobe yeah. is. This is the because this is the right upper lobe bronchus, and then there's there's just abrupt occlusion of of the bronchus intermedius. And I think the right middle lobe is this portion right here that's just completely socked in, and then the the yeah. lower lobe is more posterior. Got it. It's it's overlapping the mediastinum there. It does it does extend yeah. for. Okay, got it. Thank you. Yeah. All right, this, let's go to this one. I've shown one of these before. I don't have a radiograph, but I do have a spine, a, a scoliosis series. And this patient, I don't remember what her, I, I think she had some pr progressive neurologic symptoms. But you can see on the scoliosis radiograph, as you look down, you can see pedicles at each level until you get right here and, you know, Unfortunately, there's a grid going through it, but I think you can argue that you don't really see a pedicle on the right side. It maybe looks a little bit more loosened, although some of this could be just from the aorta and the, the azigoesophageal interface here. But this patient underwent a spine radiograph and then a CT. I'll show you the CT first, just because, like I said, I've seen one of these before. And so you see this hyper-enhancing lesion that's involving that right pedicle and almost obliterating the cord at the uh, at the T11 level. And it's expansile and it extends out into laterally as well in this vertebral body. So she didn't have a history of cancer, certainly a hypervascular metastasis, renal cell melanoma, thyroid could do that. You'll see on the, on the T2 weighted images how bright this is, almost has a little salt and pepper look to it like you might think with a paraganglioma. Uh, but this they this is uniformly hypervascular as well. And they went in and took this out and this was a, a hemangioma. So this was another invasive hemangioma. So I've shown another one that looks kind of scary like this in the past with, with disruption of the cortex and narrowing of the, of the central canal as well. But this is, I think the second one of these I've seen in the, in the thoracic spine. So it is on the differential for spine lesions, especially when the patient doesn't have a known malignancy. And it's typical, like hemangiomas are, to be bright on T2-weighted imaging and hyper-enhanced. And I think on T1, it's ISO, similar to muscle, maybe a little hypo-intense compared to muscle. Now, this is a fun one for those anybody that is doing Taver imaging, and I know Nelly is on here, and the body folks will like this. I remember from my, I remember as a medical student when I was rotating with a vascular surgeon that one of his favorite pimp questions was to always ask if a patient has no femoral pulse but does have a a pulse further down, like dorsalis pedis, what's the answer? And this is the first case I've actually seen of this. But if you look at the left side, you'll see that there's a there's a discrepancy in the size of the external iliac arteries and the femoral arteries. And on the left, you'll see that this is that the the you know, 
superficial femoral artery is really pretty wimpy there. And this is mostly just a uh, profunda artery. But you see that there's this funky artery here that goes posteriorly you know, through the sciatic notch and then proceeds posteriorly. And this is what actually extends down and then becomes the popliteal artery further down. So this is a, a you know, we always like to do our, our anatomic variants. This is a persistent sciatic artery, which is pretty rare, like I said, but it's, it's known to occur. And what's interesting in this guy is that he came in with, with gluteal pain and had fever. And this actually, this was infected. And I don't know if it was just from repeated trauma or not, but he had a pseudoaneurysm of his persistent sciatic artery on this side. So they had to go in and, and treat this. They treated him with antibiotics and then they grafted this. But you know, especially since some of us sneak down into the pelvis if we're doing tabber planning or other pre-invasive planning, I thought I'd show this just because it's a fun anatomic variant. Have you guys heard of that or seen that before? No, apparently it has a incidence of like 0.03%. <laughs> Uh, yeah, like three in ten thousand. Yes. Maybe even, maybe even that's, less than that. This is a. I found a. There's a paper from the European Journal of Vascular and Endovascular Surgery from 2009. Call it's a review article on it. Um, yeah, they just yeah. they review they reviewed 159 PSAs as they call them and um, interesting. It's it's um, it's bilateral in 30 percent. And they and ninety one of the eighty percent of their patients had symptoms such as intermittent claudication, ischemia, pulsating mass, which makes you wonder if they're prone to pseudoaneurysms. Uh, Forty percent right. had an aneurysm. So yeah, it's very interesting. Well, you'd imagine that you know sitting in chairs all day could predispose us to trauma. For sure. So, so uh, right, Jeff, one. Jeff, do you uh, have articles like that on all subjects, or is there some reason why you're so up on this particular <laughs> topic? It's called <laughs> Google persistent sciatic artery, artery and it's the first hit. <laughs> yeah, Doc, Dr. Google is pretty quick at finding stuff. Uh, I'll just show this one really quick because it's kind of, this one's interesting. This I'm showing the older images first. This is a, a, a patient who you can see, he's got some radiation fibrosis at his lung apices. He underwent a prior, he's had head and neck cancer and underwent prior surgery. Everything looks reasonable here aside from the fibrosis. And then he came in a few months ago with unilateral swelling, fever, pain all over. And since the prior exam, you can see he's undergone, he had undergone a tracheal, uh, tracheostomy, has a stoma here. And then extending from the stoma, there's a little bit of soft tissue. And you see soft of the tracheal stoma and when they went in and debrided this they got you know, half a dozen different organisms from this mostly you know mostly oral flora so from this tracheal stoma i wish i had a radiograph just to see how much asymmetry there would be in the in kind of the density of his right chest wall versus his left but unfortunately we didn't or if we were able to see air fluid levels in there but just an interesting post-op complication infection case. Wow, so, that was pretty extensive. Yeah, I'll stop there for now. I can prep some more. Okay. Um, Jeff, let me show a couple of cases that are actually apropos. All right. So this is a young woman, 19 years old. Can you see a radiograph? Yes. Okay, she um, had elective surgery about a month before. She had both of her breasts removed, not because of malignancy, but because of painful um, fibrosis in her breasts. So she had elective surgery. And then she came in with um, signs of infection on the right. 
And this radiograph was taken the day after she'd had the right tissue expander removed. The left tissue expander is still in place over here. What I was struck by was not just the edema and the atelectasis and the pleural effusion, but the widening of the mediastinum here. This is a young person, not particularly obese, and you had this wide mediastinum. I wondered whether there had been a attempted jugular catheter placement that lacerated a carotid artery, or whether she had lymphadenopathy, whether you know this was cancer surgery. So I began to investigate, and you know, other people in the room got the medical records up, and then uh, we ended up talking to the doc, and uh, turns out that she had had this surgery because of infection. So uh, I was concerned that there was, in that setting, uh, mediastinitis, and she did get a CT, so let's take a look at it. And what struck me was the smudginess of her subcutaneous fat uh, here, reflecting inflammation, a little bit of pericardial effusion, and then this tissue stranding throughout the upper mediastinal fat here. So this suggested to me there was indeed uh, mediastinitis, even though there weren't any pockets of, po uh, pockets of pus here, pockets of pus, but uh, looked to me as if there was diffuse cellulitis here in her mediastinum. And that would account for the atelectasis, the pleural effusion, and there was some lung edema, I think, on some of these cuts here, you know, uh, with lymphatic obstruction because of mediastinal swelling, she could get lung edema, she could get pleural effusions and so forth. So I think that this woman has um, a mediastinus, mediastinitis component of her widespread infection. So the cultures of her skin grew out staph aureus. It was sensitive and she was treated initially with intravenous antibiotics and then switched to um, oral antibiotics, and she didn't have any further imaging at this point. So <clears throat> I think mediastinitis is a consequence here of their, her uh, soft tissue infection from her infected um, implant. Okay, so not quite as dramatic as Travis's case that he showed just a few, couple of minutes ago. And then this woman has a series of abnormal chest radiographs uh, she's got an allergic history. I will refine um, her history. She gets um, varying consolidation, particularly in her left upper lobe, but patchy and elsewhere. Uh, here's another image showing consolidation in that left upper lobe. And then this uh, image showing a uh, fat mucus plug here. So this looks like allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. I think I have another chest radiograph where the consolidation was more dramatic, but this waxing and waning consolidate that um, mucus plug and so forth are just fine for allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. And uh, apropos of Travis's case from last week, there's very high attenuation in this uh, mucus plug as that's part of this consolidation. And with her other patches of consolidation over time. There were other instances where we had these high density um, mucus plugs reflecting aspergillus. So indeed they found aspergillus. And then we raised the question, could this be something more exotic? Because um, could this be bronchocentric granulomatosis, another variant on this condition? And so they looked at the pathology and they did, did find indeed granulomatous inflammation in addition to the aspergillus and, and so forth. So uh, this is bronchocentric granulomatosis, which is a variant of these aspergillus conditions. Here's an article from 2000 from colleagues of uh, with Nestor Miller. Jeff, I think you've heard of Nestor Miller. He's this Canadian guy, <laughs> strong Canadian accent. Um, and notice the similarity to the findings that we had in our in, in this current case here. There were other CTs that I'm not showing you that also had these nodular things along airways and burying stuff on the other side. So um, I don't know whether Nestor here talked about high attenuation mucus plugs as part of this. That reflects the aspergillus in the airway. And then it's a granulomatous response to the aspergillus. I think the important thing about this, David, is in talking to pathologists is I, 
I think some of the older literature separates bronch, uh, bronchocentric granulomatosis as a separate disease, but in reality, it's more a pattern of injury in the lung that's, they prefer the term bronchocentric granulomatous inflammation, and it is associated with uh, aspergillus infections, but also other infections as well. And I think it, it just got labeled um, mostly in the radiology literature as a separate process, but it really isn't. Right. Okay. So um, this case came by the day after Travis last week showed the high attenuation mucus plugs and ABPA. And so uh, I thought that's the problem with being shown a case of something or hearing about something because you'll find it, you'll usually see it within 48 hours and <laughs> it was only 24. Okay. All right. I'll show a few and then we can circle back around. Let's see if we can close that. Can I just ask a question? The mediastinitis case I mediastinitis case I showed you just a minute ago. I I don't think that that was just native um, thymic tissue. It too, it was much too busy for me to make that consideration. Although it was a nineteen year old woman, so I was concerned: is this just normal thymus? Mm -hmm. You guys agree that, that that was much smudgier than normal thymus would be? Yeah, I mean, normal thymus is pretty yes. well defined. Okay, so this is a, a patient of an unknown age uh, that was in a high-speed motor vehicle crash. And we've seen a couple examples of this, but it's, it's always nice to see more because they're subtle and they're easily overlooked. And you can see here is a little small filling defect, so an intimal tear. And then it has a little friend right below it. And notice we're sort of at the isthmus, the common location. Of yeah. These. yeah, we're not seeing your second screen. We're just seeing your database. Yeah, it's seeing the database. Why is it doing that? All right, we'll start over again. Here we go. Now you should see a CT scheme. Yes. Okay. So some adult patient, high-speed motor vehicle crash, and right here at the isthmus, we see a little filling defect in the aorta and then a little one right below it. And as you go down, we'll see that there are more of these. Um, let's see where there's another one right here, which is a sort of an unusual place, but I, I know Howard's shown a couple cases. I think we've seen a couple on this webinar of sort of in the mid mid segment here behind the left atrium. And what's interesting in this case also, there was more abdominal injury. Uh, as I go down, you start seeing there's, looks like hematoma. And I think this hematoma is next to the diaphragm and not in the crus, but you can see that it, it doesn't look very happy. Um, and more stranding, whoops, I gotta go back up. Uh, shoot, did I lose my images? There we go, we go back up. We see there's intramural hematoma. Go the other way here, right here, involving the abdominal aorta. You see this little intramural hematoma. So that's another type of injury, and we usually think of thoracic injuries, but they can occur in the abdomen as well. So this is, and then there's some mesenteric edema and stuff going on there. So this was a multifocal abdominal, uh, or thoracic and abdominal aortic injury from uh, blunt trauma, and uh, we don't read the abdomens in my group, but uh, it's interesting to look down there. But the um, chest ones are, are very subtle, and you have to. I always like to share these with my residents so that they don't overlook these. And for the current, the, the Society of Vascular Surgeons, their current recommendation is, you know, conservative management for these and the these little guys, and follow-up imaging is optional. Our surgeons usually get a, another CT within 48 hours, but they don't need to be stented or anything. If it's more than 10 millimeters, then you do sort of a elective or semi-elective repair. And then if you have a true pseudoaneurysm or leak, you're going to treat on those earlier. Okay, here's another aortic case. And let me see, make sure you can actually see a CT. You see a CT scan? Yes, you do. All right, so this was a patient who, an older patient who has a history of aortic stenosis. And you can see the, the valve is, is atherosclerosis. The valve is thick and calcified and developed uh, endocarditis. I don't know exactly the mechanism, but it was a staph endocarditis. And you can see he has an extra atrium here, well, it's, except it's not an atrium. You'll see there's smoke in it, Travis, a nice slow flow. So you've got pretty dense contrast in the, the aortic side and the pulmonary arterial side and even the left atrium. But this indeed is uh, not an extra atrium, but rather 
a pseudo aneurysm that's coming off the aortic root right here, um, presumably from his infection. And what's also interesting is he has another one on the other side that comes off right here. So he's got this sort of very complex um, pair of pseudo aneurysms right at the root with an already abnormal valve. And it's hard to know if there's any vegetation here, or if this is just the pre existing thickening from his uh, aortic stenosis. But yeah, this is going to have to be sorted out and um, probably resected and requiring an entire root rebuild. But with him having bacteremia, they want to clear that up as well, too. So this is one of the bigger ones I've seen. All right. Uh, this is something we've also seen uh, in our webinar before. So this is a patient with uh, shortness of breath and um, hypoxia. And this is an, a radiograph from a couple of years ago. But it, it's a nice one that it shows what looks like a, a reticular pattern. Um, but you'll notice there's no real distortion and there's also no volume loss. Here's the lateral and the lung volumes are relatively pr preserved. You don't see something that looks like fibrosis. This patient was a big time smoker, and you can see where I'm going to go with this, but just a really nice example of very advanced uh, Langerhans cell histiocytosis. And, you know, we talk about, I've talked about in the past, the sort of preserved vasculature. These vessels are pretty robust if this was all just emphysema, plus there's just too much architecture in here. Um, but what's interesting, and I'm curious what you guys think, is there's this one little strange vessel right here. If you follow it back, you know, it almost looks like a varix, but if you follow it up and down, you'll see it runs with a bronchus. There's a bronchus and it bifurcates and it goes all the way out here into this sort of hypo and hyper inflated segment in anteriorly up there. So the question is, you know, first was, is that an AVM? But there's no big, large draining vein. It's not really a varix. Um, or is it just some weird artery? He, he does have pulmonary hyper, she does have pulmonary hypertension, pretty bad actually, which is related to the PLCH. So could this sort of just be an aneurysm somehow related to altered pressure? And interestingly, it's in an area of lung that's somewhat spared from the PLCH. It actually looks um, as if there's um, bad emphysema or um, some Air congenital trapping. hyperinflation in that segment, it doesn't look like normal lung. Right, uh, right, it, it's, it's, it is abnormal. The thing, the thing that confuses me is how do you get such a big artery without any, any outflow in a, into a vein? I have a feeling that there's a, there's a vein associated with this, but we're just, we're missing it because these slices are kind of coarse. Yeah, I mean, the, it, it's interesting though, because I mean, the draining veins typically are quite large. You know, and this this is clearly following an airway. You can there's the airway that goes with it, and it yeah. just go, as it goes out into the periphery. And yeah, we were we were looking at this the other day, and just you know, there's the air, there's the bronchus, and it goes right with it, and it, it's bifurcating like a t it's not arborizing the way a vein would, where you have multiple side branches. Yeah. So um, we were trying to find a big draining vein, but really couldn't come up with one. And, it's, but there is this weird little combination here, but it's just a very tortuous thing, but sort of just this unexpected finding amongst all this PLCH. It is nice that as you go down, it really starts to drop out, but you know, it doesn't always spare the, the very bottom of the lung because um, you know, it's this severe, but you can see there's a relative sparing pretty much drops out there, but there are some cysts that go pretty deep down into the recess here. But this whole middle lobe is somewhat abnormal. It's hyperinflated yeah. and, it's a lot bigger than your typical middle lobe. So, and that I medial don't... portion really is spared. Yeah. It's just a bizarre case. So, but that's a end stage PLCH, but it has the, the pulmonary hypertension that can be, you see the PA is quite large and has, I forget what the pressures are, but uh, the right heart cath confirms that. All right, and then just a, another vascular case. This is just a nice case here. This is a patient with pulmonary hypertension. You can see the, the central pulmonary vessels are a little big. They're not huge, but I think that's oriented the wrong way, but you can see they're not big. But this, I like this case because a lot of the CTEF we've seen, you know, is either very peripheral where there's very little clot or there's just a few webs here and there and you have a lot more peripheral disease. You can see the RV is dilated, the RN atrium is dilated, there's hypertrophy, uh, pulmonary arteries quite 
generous, not, not as bad as other ones, but this is really nice central clot. And this would be, this is the kind of patient that is a good candidate in most cases for s surgery because you've got these heaped up clots, there's calcium in them that's been there and it's very central. So it's a lot easier to get the plane. You can see the, the upper lobe branch here is, is pretty much gone. There's a little contrast getting through it. So it's probably a thread like area. And that corresponds, of course, with nice mosaic attenuation. So Patient's supposed to get a VQ scan, I think, next week, but I don't. I, didn't, I wanted to go ahead and show this one because you can see you can predict the VQ scan right there. Uh, and there's some other areas as well with just some really, really large central clot, the recanalization. So this is a very classic appearance of CTEF. And I don't think there's going to be a whole lot of uh, peripheral disease on the on the. I mean, there may be a little bit, but not a lot on the VQ scan that we're missing uh, because we we, are, we see the mosaic attenuation pretty well already. So just a nice CTEF case. All right. Uh, I think that's all. I, I may have some other ones I can pull back up. Um, Travis, you want to show a couple more? Sure. Okay. I have a series of, of four cases that are related, as you will see. These are actually two families of of parents and and offspring this is the first one and this is a more recent case and these are all patients that were referred to our interstitial lung disease program and occasionally i think we we encounter cases like this where you look at the fibrosis and it's really just a hard pattern of fibrosis to classify in this case you see reticulation and there are several cysts there's some traction bronchiectasis the cysts have you know pretty much a peribronchovascular distribution, I think. Some of them are along airways, as you see in, in multiple lobes. And there may be some ground glass, although some of this ground glass could be fibro uh, fine fibrosis. But it's it's very much a diffuse process. So it's not something that we're gonna be able to characterize as a, as a UIP pattern. It's certainly inconsistent with UIP, but really hard to, to give a specific diagnosis in this case. And the interesting thing about this one is that this patient started having symptoms just within the last couple of years. As you can see, he's 45 years old. And I'll show you what his son looks like, or or, or I, I don't remember. If, I think, yeah, this is his son. But this is a few years ago. The, the son came in and developed respiratory failure at age six months. And it was a few years. This was one of the CTs in hospital. And you can just see just the few scrum glass opacities. These, thick slices, maybe a little bit of, maybe there's some subpleural fibrosis here. You know, not a lot that you can, you can go on with that one. He ended up with prolonged intubation, but then on the follow-up study, now you can see he has some little cysts in a, in a not dissimilar distribution and just diffusely abnormal lungs. And he'd been referred multiple places. They had done a genetic analysis and it wasn't until I think maybe 2016 here you can see at this point he's three years old and still has those cysts and, and abnormal lungs where they did the genetic analysis and finally found a mutation which was in his surfactant C. So he has a surfactant protein C mutation. And it's just interesting because it was only after they detected it in the, in the, the child here that they went back and started working up the father and so we don't have genetic analysis on him yet but this is almost certainly going to going to also be a familial fibrosis from surfactant protein c deficiency and i've shown cases we've seen a whole host of different mutations i know david and jeff have shown these too the telomeropathies like the h tert uh, hermansky pudlak can give it to you uh, disc dyskeratosis congenita there's a new one, COPA syndrome, that we've seen a few cases of. But I think when, whenever we have these difficult to classify fibrosis patterns, it's often due to a familial fibrosis. And so this is a family with surfactant protein C. And it's really interesting just how some of them present younger, some of them present older. Here's another one. This is, and I, I found this one from our database. This patient was 17 at the time. Dyspnea, not as severe, but you can still see he's got some fine fibrosis and reticulation. It's more in the upper lobes than it is in the lower lobes, but other than that, really not much to go on. 
And a lot of times these patients, when they have pathology, as this patient did, it was mixed pattern of, of NSIP, UIP, a lot of bronchocentric, bronchiolocentric fibrosis on the histologic specimen. But this was also a patient with surfactant protein C deficiency and a little bit more mild of a case. And that will show his parent who had presented actually earlier. So in this case, it was the, the parent that was found first and then the son. But what's interesting in his case is, this is a while ago, you can see his fibrosis, and these are thick slices. These are actually, so old, they're seven millimeter slices, but he has a little bit of reticulation. You can see probably some fine fibrosis centrally here, but he actually had this, as you can see in his right lower lobe, which on subsequent studies did not go away. And in fact, got a little bit bigger. So he was diagnosed with his fibrosis at the time they did a right lower lobectomy to resect this large adenocarcinoma that he had. Now I can't find, he was only 42 at the time. You know, we certainly think about increased risk of cancer and some forms of fibrosis. I have no idea if I couldn't find anything on that in the setting of, of surfactant protein C deficiency. But I think you could argue that some of these, the four cases I've shown all, you know, they look similar, just varying degrees of severity of this fibrosis with a lot of reticulations, some of it more peribronchovascular and more upper lobe. This is a, a case from, or a series from the Blue Journal where they looked at 20 patients with familial pulmonary fibrosis, did mutation analysis and found five of the 20 that had surfactant protein C deficiency. Now these were all adults. And you can see various, this is the only CT images in here, but similar findings in a few of these cases to what I just showed you in these. So it's one of those mutations that they don't often check for, at least initially, especially in adults. But when you have a family history, it's certainly one that, that gets evaluated for on a frequent basis. Have you guys encountered these? I'm not um, aware of any. Um, have you seen Hermaski Podliak? I've I've only seen it in articles, and it does look like this. I've I have, yeah, I have two cases of it that I've seen. I have neither. Of, um, Jeff, hide my screen for a second, and I'll I'll pull them up because I'm I don't want to expose anything else. All right, uh, let's see. There, yeah, I'm David, my screen instead. Okay, are you going to show one? Or are you? I can wait, or I can show one real quickly. Go ahead and show it, and then I'll I'll just pull up these. Okay, this is just a uh, this is nothing um, stuff we've also seen before, but another interesting example. So this is a patient with Sjogren syndrome, uh, middle aged female, and has the very typical findings of of lymphoid interstitial pneumonia. So we can see there's some thin walled cysts. But we're what's interesting, your, uh, we're not seeing monitor two. Uh, why is that okay? Now are you? Yes. You are. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So middle-aged woman, uh, I think the long window, there we go. So we see um, some very thin wall perivascular cysts, very typical of LIP. And we also have seen lots of nodules and Howard likes to talk about the nodules. These nodules are interesting though. They're more blobby than anything, but they are associated with the cysts. And um, I mean, this is presumed LIP. Now, for some reason, I was called about this case because the nuclear medicine folks called me, and that's how it came to my attention. I said, well, it looked like LIP, and of course, all these nodules are hypermetabolic, which makes sense because they're often lymphoid aggregates. So in this case, it's probably not just protein deposition, but cells actively there. Um, and you know, at this point, they're all fairly uniform, so... Uh, we do, we have seen some malt lymphomas when one of these starts to take off. And I think when they get bigger than about two or three centimeters, you start raising some red flags. And then I quickly have a um, companion case. This is a biopsy proven case. This is a 41 year old male who has also just scattered very few thin walled cysts. And I'm going to make them a little bigger, uh, but also perivascular uh, all through the lungs and has known uh, renal amyloidosis. Uh, no underlying plasma cell dyscrasia or anything like that. So this is um, 
you know, Howard talks about getting the cyst, the protein deposition can also cause the cyst formation, presumably from obstruction of the small airways. So, so I, I think of LIP amyloid and light chain really as a spectrum, and depending on what the cells are doing, um, is going to affect your manif your imaging manifestations. So, did the uh, so there's no lung biopsy, but he has renal renal amyloid. That's right, and he has no yeah, he has known renal amyloid. They've done all the stuff on. So the the presumption is this is pulmonary amyloid because there's no other explanation for his cysts in his lung. Yeah, I think oh. the other the other thing the, the other mechanism I think for getting cysts in that setting of a protein deposition is that the um, macrophages that are trying to clear that protein end up digesting the lung. So it may not just be obstruction of small airways; it may be actual lung excavation. Okay. All right. Do you guys see my screen? Yeah. Yes. Okay. This is the, I, I can only find one of the two cases. I'm pretty sure we have two Hermansky Pupai cases here. This is a 52 year old and I'll pull up his, his summary here. That I think he's, Indi yeah, he's Indian. And he, he was in a study you know, years ago, was diagnosed with Hermansky Pupai syndrome. He has the typical you know, other findings, I think that, um, yeah, he has he has oculocutaneous albinism, and then he has a, a platelet deficiency. So he he met the criteria that way. They did a a gene sequencing, and he has one of the gene mutations for it. But his fibrosis, as you can see, is he has some subpleural reticulation, some little foci of honeycombing. In the lower lobes, it's much more of a, it's a little bit more diffuse with, you know, traction, some reticulation, probably some ground glass opacity that's out of proportion to the amount of fibrosis here. Let me see what it looks like in 2017. Yeah, here it's progressed more and there's a lot more ground glass centrally in the lower lobes. It's still a, a difficult pattern to classify, not typical of you know, a specific diagnosis. So this was the case. This is one of the cases I have of that, and I can also. I thought I had saved a case of dyskeratosis congenita because we've seen that on occasion too. But I'll. I can try and get those for next week. I, well, I, I just pulled down my two uh, Hermansky okay. bootlegs too. I can show them. It's interesting. Yeah. W one is a little bit different. Um, so let me just see. Now I got to show the right screen this time. All right, let's see. So this is this one is from is one of ours and I'll hold on I'll show you the there you should see CT there so th this is a this patient is from Puerto Rico this is an old study but you can see that this is what the radiograph looks like you've got distortion probably some pulmonary hypertension too um, but on the CT um, we see ground glass but also this reticulation and traction bronchiectasis and this one is almost more reminiscent of an NSIP. It's more peribronchovascular. And there's not as much down the lower lobes. A little, there's a cyst here and patients breathing, but it's not a, it's again, one of the ones you really can't put a great name on it, but uh, it doesn't, doesn't look like UIP. It doesn't look like your typical hypersensitivity, but um, this one had the, the, the all the, the uh, albinism and all the other stuff that goes along with it. And then the one that looks more like your case, Howard, uh, Travis, this was from Tom Lucia Muhammad. He'd sent around. Uh, this is another Puerto Rican um, who has more of the cystic stuff that you showed, the peripheral uh, ground glass reticulation and then these weird little cystic spaces. And this one had a surgical biopsy that presumably confirmed the pattern of fibrosis. But it's very asymmetric, kind of interesting. Almost looks like areas maybe of organized pneumonia at one point. Mm-hmm. I don't have any clinical information, but yeah. yeah, they always look strange. And I think your point at the very beginning is these familial fibrosis and all these mutations, they just, you can't, they don't fit our paradigm. We don't have a good, we can just say there's some fibrosis and we can't really give a differential of UIP or NSIP or it's just, it's like, it's fibrosis, not otherwise specified. Right. Have I shown any of the cases of COPA syndrome yet or not? I can't remember if I was saving those or uh, 
because it's a different it's a different familial one i can show it um if you want to give me control yeah uh, let's see i don't think i've seen one so i don't even know how to spell it well it's copa syndrome and it was this is a patient who we saw a couple years ago and you can see this one looks similar to the surfactant cases the, at least the most severe case i was showing just tons of, of cysts and holes there's some traction but it's not a lot of, of traction and i don't i don't know what this nodule is this is a 22 year old and this was a patient who was actually retrospectively diagnosed with the disorder because the mutation was found by one of our pulmonologists in his lab just a couple of years ago i don't even i don't remember if i have the Let's see. Yeah, the um, right. So it was one of those things where it, he was kind of diagnosed retrospectively once this um, once this mutation was actually identified. And now we found a few patients with this syndrome. If you just if you Google it, there's a couple of of different cases. But as you can see, this is markedly advanced fibrosis, especially for somebody who's this young. And he also had a family member with the, the disorder as well, but just a otherwise difficult fibrosis to classify. And I don't know if his pectus car carinatum is part of the the disorder as well. But was one, of no. other, one of your other patients had pectus. Was it the child, the um, the infant? The other, let's see. This one. Uh, was no, it, was, the baby? It, was, it, it was. Uh, maybe a little or just well uh it may not be this one but i think one of the other patients shown today had uh, pectus yeah paranatum so i again there's i don't think as jeff was just saying just to reiterate yeah. yeah there's there's no way to really to look at one of these and say oh this is surfactant protein right. c deficiency versus hermansky food lack versus you know copa syndrome versus whatever but they but they can have bizarre looks that don't fit into our typical idiopathic interstitial pneumonia classification. So what is what is the um, what is the gene mutation in Hermansky Pudluck? Is that um, I don't know what what the gene is for that. What is it doing? I I don't remember. But you get yeah. It's been a while since I've looked at. It. I don't know, Jeff. Do you remember? It's not a surfactant thing. I don't. No, I don't think so. It's I know it's uh, autosomal recessive. Yeah. Apparently, there's different types, so that may there may be different mutations because like in most of the cases are reported in a very small corner of Puerto Rico. But Travis's patient, you said, was from India, right? Yes. So maybe they're different. There must be different genes in the. I I vaguely remember it, the Hermansky food like maybe due to have something to do with the platelet, dysfun platelet dysfunction as well in the lungs resulting in fibrosis but i can't i don't remember yeah, you have to look it up let's see if i can find anything yeah apparently there's like looks like eight or nine different genes <laughs> there there's like three there's four groups of them and there's different mutations on those but there's at least four different ones so it's i don't know exactly why All right. All right, guys. Well, thanks. And Howard should be back next week. Cool. Talk to you guys then. Have a good yeah, week. Take care. You too. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye bye.